Dear brothers and sisters, Israel crossed the overflowing Jordan, relying on God alone, and conquered the cities in the central region, including Jericho and Ai. Without taking a break, Israel defeated the united forces of the southern region and won great victory against the kings of the northern region. It's not that they'd driven out all of the Canaanites, but in general, the land of Canaan came under Israel's governance. But this was not the end. Up to that point, all the tribes united as one and won victory by Joshua's faith. But from then on, each tribe had to win battles by their own strength. Joshua distributed the entire Canaan land, both the areas that had been conquered and the ones that hadn't been among the trials of Israel. This distribution of the land must have been an inspiring incident for the Israelites. They unfairly suffered as slaves in Egypt, wandered in the harsh wilderness for 40 years, and engaged in hard battles for seven years. Finally, it was the moment for them to weep their fruit. They were assigned their own dwelling place where they could happily li- live with their beloved families and farm together. But it doesn't mean they enjoyed peace right, right after they were allotted their land. Each tribe needed to wage battles by faith and entirely destroy the remaining Canaanites. They had to conquer their inheritance with faith, without changing their heart, without forgetting God's promise, without turning away from Him or forsaking His commands. Today, we'll explore how each tribe was allotted their inheritance and conquered it. Listening to this message, I ask you to think about how you've acted. If you had been in their shoes, to apply this message in yourselves, as you apply this message, we find our situation good. When senior pastor was with us, we just followed the senior pastor's march of faith. And so we lived under misconception. We thought we had great faith. And we thought we would also be able to take it by faith. But now, as we, in this situation, we have to act by faith. The Israelites were the same. They were not fighting with Joshua. They had to take the land for themselves. So I'm sharing this. This closely relates to our situation. They were with Joshua. And we also learn a lesson that we shouldn't complain. And if we rely on God alone, we can also experience God's work the same way. Also, when Joshua's army, when Joshua's people, as they, by looking at how they uh, fought for seven years, we can see that Joshua's God is our God as well. And that we can also act by faith. But... As we, I mean, this sermon series, we have to look at our situation. We have to find out what God wants from us. We have to have an awakening out of this message. We can, you can apply what you've heard so far into your situation. And also today, we can find out We should find out what Father God wants from us right now. That's why Father God allowed us this situation so that we can check ourselves. Without this situation, we would live with misconception and that we... If we find out what we were like in the final judgment, it's no use. But in this situation, we can look at ourselves, examine ourselves. When we were with the shepherd, we thought of our faith great. We thought of ourselves being sanctified. We thought of ourselves longing for New Jerusalem. But actually, what we are like right now is my real 
being. If you have such an awakening, this is a blessing. We shouldn't be discouraged. When we were with the shepherd, you thought your faith was great, and you thought you have cast off a lot of evil. Yes, you did. You did a lot of effort. But now, what about now? Are you feeling discouraged? Even if you feel feel, feel discouraged, I mean, because you can start over from now, you, you have to put yourself on alert and change yourselves again, and then we won't be discouraged on the day of the final judgment. So that's why this situation is essential for us. As you hear the next sermon as well, you can again examine yourself and look at your f- where your faith is. You have to admit yourself. Admit your current spiritual situation and fix yourselves. And then, what we've learned and seen with our shepherd, it stays in our heart. You have to remind yourself of them and re- turn from your ways and change yourself. You can change even quickly. Let's say we haven't even heard or seen what s e n i o r Pastor did. We are very different from those people who were not with the shepherd. But we, when we were with the s h i n a h pastor, we thought we had a mis... We thought we've achieved something, but as we look at ourselves, we have to admit ourselves, admit our evil, and make an effort to change ourselves. As you do so, we have to set a standard with the words of life shared by a senior pastor and his march of faith. And what he did gives us a lot of strength. It makes a lot of difference. If we hadn't seen what he did, I mean, it makes a lot of difference. So we can do it. But the problem is we have to look at where we are spiritually. We have to keep engraved their experiences on our mind I pray in our Lord's name that all of you will finally take all God's promises of blessings by faith without having a change of heart at all. Now, each tribe came before God and was allotted their inheritance. Just because Israel comprised 12 tribes doesn't mean the land of Canaan on the west of the Jordan was divided into 12 pieces of land. What I'm saying is, After they crossed the Jordan, I mean, they were on the west side of Canaan. This land was not divided into 12 pieces because there were a few exceptions. First, the sons of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, who were already given their inheritance on the east of the Jordan, were excluded. Here, the half-tribe of Manasseh literally referred to the half of the sons of Manasseh. Second, the tribe of Levi that was not supposed to receive the land was excluded. Third, the tribe of Joseph that had taken a double share as a single tribe was excluded. There were three exceptions. First, the sons of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh had already been allotted their land before they crossed the Jordan. Before they fought battles with Joshua, when they were on the east side, they already received their inheritance. That's the land they received as inheritance. That's not the land they gained By fighting with Joshua, the two two and a half tribes received that land on the east side as inheritance. And uh, they, I mean, before the conquest of Canaan began in earnest under Joshua's leadership, they received their inheritance already. They spent almost 38 years in the wilderness. 
and and the twelve spies spied out the land of Canaan. They failed to com- make a confession of faith. As a result, they stayed there in the wilderness. And after their life in the wilderness was over, they went moved over to Moab, where they could look over, overlook the land of Canaan. You looked at the map. That's the land they received as inheritance. and that's the land they gained when Moses was alive they won great victory as they they won great victory against the Gentiles and the Gentile nations remember what Israel did and they were frightened those pieces of land were on the east side of Jordan They spent 38 years in the wilderness and the Israelites experienced a harsh life in the wilderness. They were heading towards Canaan. When they were on the east side of Jordan, they took the land, pieces of land. As they passed through the harsh land, I mean, after their life in the wilderness was over, they they saw those lands really good. They thought it would be really good to live on those land. It was different from the wilderness. They had, the land had a lot of grass to feed their cattle on and that's why they asked for the land and Moses granted their request but there was a condition. The condition was when Israel conquered the other side of Jordan. They were not to say, we are out of these battles because we've already got our inheritance. They shouldn't say so. That was the condition. Moses granted their request and handed those pieces of land to those tribes, but he presented a condition that they should also fight even after they crossed the Jordan. That was the condition that they and they accepted that condition and they promised Moses saying your servants will do as my Lord commands our little ones our wives our livestock and our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead while your servants everyone who is armed for war will cross over in the presence of the Lord to battle they were promising that As Moses command, they would cross over to the other side of the Jordan and fight with them. And after they crossed the Jordan, the conquest battles began in earnest. And they left their families on the east side and crossed the Jordan. With that condition, they received the land on the east side. They went ahead. They took the lead in fighting against the Canaanites. They did as they promised. I mean, as promised, the trials of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed the Jordan with other tribes, leaving their families, livestock, cattle, and their possessions on the east of the river. And they took the lead in bravely fighting until the conquest battles were over. Because the battles were over, all they had to do was go back to the east side of the Jordan. They didn't need another inheritance on the west side. That's why these two tribes and a half were excluded. Next, the Levites serving as priests exceptionally didn't receive land as an inheritance. We will again talk about them in the back of this sermon. With the two, uh, with two and a half tribes who received inheritance on the east side. I mean, with the 
With two and a half tribes excluded among the twelve tribes, the land could have been assigned to eight and a half tribes. But there was another to consider. It was the tribe of Joseph. With God's blessings, the sons of Joseph multiplied more than other tribes. So the offspring of Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, received their share respectively. So, overall, nine and a half tribes were allotted their land on the west side of the Jordan. God already told Moses principles in distributing the land. God said, To the larger group you shall increase their inheritance, and to the smaller group you shall diminish their inheritance. Each shall give in their inheritance according to those who were numbered of them. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. If this rule had been decided later on, they would have been dis- disputed. But God, had a- God already told this- did these principles to Moses. God had the land distributed according to each tribe's population and had them decide by lot which land each would receive. How fair this is. This was the fairest way that could prevent complaints about their respective inheritance. People could have said, we like this, we hate that. To Not to make this happen, God had them decide things by lot. It's because the chance of taking better land was the same for all the tribes, regardless of the order of casting a lot. Casting a lot first didn't guarantee that they would get better land. Also, the Israelites had faith that the outcome of the casting of lots would be up to God, not coincidental. The Bible says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Also, in the process of Israel had experienced this. You know, also, in the process of revealing Achan's sin by the means of casting lots, God had him selected among all the Israelites which were numerous. Based on that experience, the Israelites could believe all the more firmly that God had control over the process of their receiving an inheritance. The tribes took turns casting a lot, but there was a problem while they were being allotted their inheritance. The sons of Joseph, namely the tribes namely the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, said to Joshua, Why have you given me only one lot and one portion for an inheritance, since I am a numerous people whom the Lord has thus far blessed? They were saying that they were originally one, but grew into two tribes by God's blessing, so they had to receive more as their inheritance. Actually, the inheritance they had all the en, the inheritance they'd already received was never small. Rather, their territory covered the vast areas of fertile land and good land in the central region. Still, they complained, insisting that they receive more as a great tribe. And Joshua replied. If you are a numerous people, go up to the forest and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the Rephraim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. Namely, if they lacked land to cultivate, they could just go up to the forest and expand their territory. But the sons of Joseph again grumbled against Joshua rather than obeying. They said, The hill country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who live in the valley land have chariots of iron. Both those who are in Beth Shean and its towns and those who are in the valley of Zezreel. 
They made such negative comments. They claimed that even if they conquered that area, that wouldn't be enough. So they demanded wider and better land. They also said with fear that Israel hadn't got iron weapons yet, but in the land they would conquer what were frightening chariots of iron. They'd already forgotten. They'd already forgotten why their parents suffered a 40-year trial and ended up in the wilderness. Among the 12 spies that initially spied out the Canaan, 10 of them failed to make confessions of faith involving their fleshly thoughts, even though God was with Israel. They'd seen the ten plagues striking Egypt and the splitting of the Red Sea. They saw bitter water turning into sweet water and water springing up when a rock was hit. When they craved meat, God sent them numerous quails to which they could help themselves. Although God proved His being with them in various ways, the ten spies complained and failed to demonstrate faith, thereby causing God's wrath. The same went for the sons of Joseph. They'd seen, heard of, and learned from their parents' mistakes, so they followed and obeyed Joshua so far. But as they were in a position to demonstrate their own faith without Joshua, they made that confession out of fear. Everyone, how can we decide whether someone has faith or not? If we look at the reality and say something, it's not faith. The ten spies looked at the reality and made confessions. And the sons of Joseph, they also looked at the reality. They said like they had so strong weapons, so it would be difficult for us to conquer the land. But because they saw the reality, Because they saw the reality, God was gone. But even if we find our situation difficult, we can confess, if God is with us, we can do it. That's spiritual faith. But the sons of Joseph, because they were told to conquer the land for themselves, they said it would be difficult, it would be impossible. If we are in a situation like theirs, what kind of confession should we make? We've witnessed God being with the shepherd and manifesting numerous wonders, signs, and works of power. We've seen the blind opening their eyes, the mute and the deaf beginning to speak and hear, and the cripples standing up. Numerous times we've seen and heard of people heal the polio, cerebral palsy, cancer, leukemia, AIDS, etc. So, Would you boldly confess God is still living and manifest His power? I firmly believe. Would you confess this way? But the important thing is whether we can demonstrate our faith in the face of a problem in our life. We can talk about this and that, about others' problems. We can advise others to do this, do this and that. It would be good for you to do this. You just act with faith, march with faith, commit things to God. We can talk about, we can give advice to others like that. But especially, we may think, the ch- also senior pastor, when senior pastor talks about uh, people's mistakes, He also says, if you are in their situation, how would you do? And the sons of Joseph made such a confession, but we have to look at ourselves based on their confession. We've spent many times with the shepherd. We saw the works of power. So even when the senior pastor mentioned about the visions and dreams, we said amen because because of what we saw. But even when she said about the future things, even they seemed impossible, we said amen. And then you should demonstrate your faith in your own life and you can't 
you should ex- enjoy the fruit of your... Even if we see and hear many things, not all of us have faith out of them. Some people develop spiritual faith by seeing or hearing of God's power or develop greater faith, while others have only knowledge-based faith from what they've seen and heard of. The sons of the Israelites who were with Moses did so. They saw many things manifested by Moses, but in the face of a reality, they couldn't display faith. That So, having watched many things doesn't mean we have spiritual faith. But does this mean seeing and hearing many things is useless? No, we have an opportunity to spiritual faith. It is our share whether or not we receive spiritual faith. Even if God shows us many things, whether we have spiritual faith or fellowship faith is up to us. You... The, all the works manifested at the church by the shepherd whether you have them by your faith or not if you really have them in your faith you should um, display faith in your own life we have to check ourselves as to whether we act by such faith but even if we have, we've seen many things even if we remember them If we just keep them as knowledge-based faith, you know, no matter how great your knowledge-based or fleshly faith is, you cannot bring down God's work. But if you display spiritual faith, even if it's small as a mustard seed, God works for you. Then, how can we have spiritual faith? As you engrave the evidences of the living God you've seen and heard of, you believe that He is living. He is truly living. You believe that in your heart. If we don't see anything, we can just have knowledge-based faith. But because we see with our own eyes, we can have an opportunity to have spiritual faith. As we share this message, I once mentioned this. When a senior pastor was uh, conducting an overseas crusade in the United States, one of the pastors in attendance confessed to senior pastor as he before he saw the works manifested by the shepherd he didn't believe uh, I mean even though he knew about the biblical works and he believed in them but he just considered them as myth as legend even as a pastor he did so but as he witnessed the works manifested by the shepherd he realized that they were not myths and they were truly the works that really happen. That's how the pastor repented. Without seeing or hearing, it wouldn't be easy for us to... But because we have seen and heard of these works, we have an opportunity to confess God is truly living. But that alone doesn't mean we have spiritual faith. We have the foundations for us to have spiritual faith. So we have to live by the Word of God. Why? God is living, and God's will is recorded in the Bible. If we believe in Him, it's only natural that we live by the Word. Because you don't believe in Him, you don't live by the Word. They say like, we know things only after we die. We don't know what would happen. If you truly believe, you believe that you will face retribution if you commit sins. In the afterlife, everyone receives retribution. If you see people committing evil, not facing judgment, you you have to know that everyone is judged finally. You have to be frightened. But if you don't believe in God, you are not frightened. Even Even while you commit sins, you are not scared. You just think of this life as everything. Even if you disadvantage others, even if you commit evil against others, you don't know about God's judgment because you don't believe in Him. But if you truly believe in His living, you cannot commit sins or evil. God, you know that God looks at even the most sacred things. If you act in such a way, you receive spiritual faith. In other words, 
if you listen to His word, I mean, then as you engrave the evidences of the living God you've seen and heard of, you believe that He is living, so you live by His will. You say, I've seen many things. I've lived the longest Christian life for many years in the, here in this church. If, if you have seen and heard of many things, then you have to obey what He has told us. Only then you will have spiritual faith. With that spiritual faith, you can bring down God's power that makes impossible things possible. But even if you memorize all the words of the 66 books of the Bible, if you don't act by it, you cannot have spiritual faith. After you hear words like, don't hate, love your enemies, if you achieve a heart by which you love even your enemies without hatred, you've cultivated your heart into spirit. Then, God gives you spiritual faith by which you can truly believe and He works according to that faith. In our heart is a dark part and a white part. We have a part that we've cultivated into truth. To that extent, we receive spiritual faith. It's not that God hates someone, uh, some people, and loves others. It's not that God favors anyone. You may say, why doesn't God give me spiritual faith? It's because you haven't cultivated your heart into truth. Even after you hear a lot of words, but you don't act by them, you still hate others, you still don't love others, you still live the the way as you please. That's why you fail to receive spiritual faith. That's why you fail to receive His answer. You have to cultivate your heart in, in truth. Then, whenever you face a trouble, you pray and you receive answers. But, unless you cultivate your heart into truth, let's say you face a problem and you pray, you cannot have spiritual faith. So, no matter how many times you pray, you cannot receive answer or His answer is delayed. Whenever you have a trouble or trial, you ask God for this and that. But the more important thing is you have to repent of the things that cause you to and you have to circumcise your heart. This is the quickest way you receive answers and blessings. So, thus, just because you've long been a Christian and worked a lot for His kingdom, you don't have great spiritual faith. But to the extent you strive to obey His words and achieve a spiritual heart, you have great faith. But despite having experienced numerous works of God, the sons of Joseph failed to demonstrate faith, saying that their enemies had chariots of iron. They themselves revealed that their complaints originated from such an improper heart. Their complaints and confessions without faith came from the desire to take a better one and from an arrogant heart wanting to be served as a great tribe. They said like, God blessed us, but Joshua, why don't you give us that blessing? What an improper heart they had. Because they'd grown big by God's blessing, they should have lowered themselves, served other tribes, and taken the lead in advancing even to the regions difficult to conquer. But they just sat back and complained, asking for more. They were very different from Caleb, who confessed and marched in faith. He said, Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken.
That's what he confessed. Caleb neither exalted himself nor forcefully insisted on his rights. Relying on God's previous promise, he requested by faith. He didn't ask for an area already conquered. I mean, he relied on his word, and he asked for it with greater faith. He didn't ask for an area already conquered, but the one inhabited by the robust Anakites. The land where they were dwelling, they, the land which he had to conquer by battles, without fearing them at all, Caleb proclaimed that he would win by relying on God alone. And according to his faith, he took Hebron. But the sons of Joseph failed to demonstrate such faith. Unlike when they fought with Joshua, They even revealed their fear, making a confession that lacked faith. When they were with Joshua, they also marched by faith, but their faith was not their true faith. It was the time that they should have marched in faith. You know, when you are surrounded in a situation when people are filled with the Spirit, we are also filled with the Spirit, and That's the time we can demonstrate our faith. But if we find ourselves in a difficult situation, that's when we can look at where we are spiritually. As we look at the sons of Joseph, we can look at ourselves. We can also remember how great Caleb's faith was. Even if the enemy had possessed stronger weapons than the chariots of iron, With true faith, they would have no reason for fear. Accompanied by Joshua, they trusted and obeyed him, crossing the Jordan and destroying Jericho. They'd already experienced the stopping of the sun and the moon. Throughout their conquest battles directed by Joshua, they could defeat enemies incomparably incomparably stronger than themselves, which was a continuation of miracles. During the seven-year conquest battles, I mean, those battles were not, never easy. They were harsh, fierce battles, but because God was with them, they could win victory. During those battles, they only obeyed no matter how dangerous they found their situation, but as they were told to take their inheritance by fighting on their own, they made a confession lacking faith. When they, when they had to show their faith, they feared and revealed their lack of faith. Instead of giving in to their complaints, Joshua reminded them of their being wrong and demanded that they have faith on their own. I thought this confession was awesome, Joshua's confession. He didn't say like, you must be having a hard time. He didn't deal with them in fleshly affection, but he boldly told them to act by faith. How awesome he was. Joshua said to them, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one lot only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it, and to its farthest borders it shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites even though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. This was the faith of Joshua. Also, Joshua reassured them that if they unchangingly demonstrated the deeds of faith they displayed in the battles accompanied by him, they would expand their territory to their heart's content as a great tribe blessed by God. Today's title is wonderful. It shall be yours. This title should be yours as well. If you, to make that happen, you have to remember that there is always a condition. The condition is for you to display faith. Instead of fleshly thought, you have to demonstrate faith. Everyone likes the words of blessing. Everyone likes the words of comfort and consolation. But to receive that blessing, they don't like to hear 
conditions of blessing. But no matter how much I say, may you be blessed, blessings doesn't come upon you. You have to prepare your vessel. So pastors, when you visit others, you have to figure out their spiritual problems and you have to also give them advice with love so that they can have spiritual faith and receive God's answers and blessings. We have to make the words of blessing ours. We have to... But regrettably, the sons of Joseph failed to obey Joshua wholly. The Bible says, but they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezar, so the Canaanites live in the midst of Ephraim to this day, and they became first laborers. Other verses say, but the sons of Manasseh could not take possession of these cities because the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. The tribes, the two tribes, didn't drive them out. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. It came about when the sons of Israel became strong. They put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Both the tribe of Ephraim and that of Manasseh didn't completely drive out the Canaanites residing within their inheritance. If the sons of Joseph had displayed faith and driven them out, today's Israel would have more peace. But because they failed to obey and didn't drive them out, those Canaanites bothered them through generations. While Israel loved God and dwelled in His Word, Israel remained strong, ruling over the Canaanites. But as Israel worshipped idols and turned away from God, the Canaanites became stronger and tormented Israel. The more serious problem was, the Canaanites caused Israel to come in contact with the wicked and Gentile customs prohibited by God. commit sins, and bring about God's wrath. Israel committed things prohibited by God. They and they brought about God's wrath. If they had conquered the land, I mean, they should have firmly displayed their faith in the first place and obeyed God wholly. But as they failed, they suffered through generations. The God of power who was with Joshua wasn't just the God of a single person, Joshua, but the God of the entire Israel. God desired all the Israelites to have strong and bold faith as that of Joshua. If all If only they had shown faith again, God would have manifested all the works that He did through Joshua. If the sons of Joseph had acted with such faith, no doubt they could have driven out the Gentiles who had chariots of iron. It's the same today. While God shows the works of His power at this church, He doesn't want us to just keep them as knowledge, but make spiritual strength out of them. He also wants us to act by faith on our own, thereby manifesting amazing works demonstrating His presence. He wants us to challenge ourselves and win victory In our carrying out our duties, He wants us to act by faith so that we can receive His blessings and glorify Him. I mean, moreover, we already have the handkerchief of power on which Senior Pastor prayed. With this handkerchief, not only should we be able to heal ourselves, but heal others and resolve their problems as we visit or evangelize them. Then, that's why we've acted when we were with the senior pastor. Because senior pastor is not with us, it is no longer, I mean, God is still glorified through the handkerchief. And through online meetings or gatherings, God works. God works this way. 
and all of you should experience the same. Some people act by faith and experience His power, but others, they say, because the pastor is not with us, I'm not happy, and things happen according to their confession. Why don't you... We have to... With this handkerchief of power, we have to heal ourselves and give glory to God. We have to raise others. We have to bring back those souls who left the church. We have to plant faith in them. We have to fast for them and pray for them and make them, bring them back alive. Then, when God works mightily with the power of recreation all over the world, as warriors of faith, we can say, here I am, and be used by Him. Remember, when you are with the shepherd, when when you are filled with the Spirit, when we were dreaming of the power of recreation being completed, and people confess like, I want to serve, I want to serve as the district leaders. I want to serve as the, His worker. I want to achieve revival. I want to advance to a higher position. But what about now? Do you say, it's not time for us to rev- revive? No, we have to achieve revival even now. If you say, it's impossible, things will go just as you confess. If you say, it's impossible, things will go as you say. But if if you say it's possible, things will be done so. Father God will work. He will bring back souls and He will strengthen our faith. If we bring... I mean, it's also important to make each one of our faith stronger. We have to make revival both in spirit and in flesh. But if you think it's impossible, it really will be impossible. What about the sons of Joseph? They were not different from the first generation of the Israelites. It's not Father God wants from us. Based on what we've seen and heard of, we have to trust in them and act by faith. That's what Father God wants from us. And through such people, Father God will use us and He will be glorified through us. When our, when our shepherd was with us, he brought down God's amazing words with his faith. We have to admit this fact. It was all by Sina Patrick's obedience and his faith. It was truly the fruit of the shepherd. We have to admit this. It's not that we had no reward. Because we prayed together, we also received reward for that. But what about now? What about now when s i n a p a s t o r is not with us? According to what we've done and sown, you bear fruit. According to your respective work, we receive the fruit of revival and receive the fruit of other areas. According to our respective work, ourselves, some of you may be complimented, others may be others may find yourself lacking, but it's not too late. Even now, it's not too late. We can remind ourselves of the words of truth we've heard, discover our shortcomings, and change ourselves through fervent prayer. Some of you may say, I've been living, I've been with this church for 10 years, but I'm still like this. But it's not. What you've heard, you you have foundation. You have foundation so you can build up your faith more quickly because you have that foundation. You already laid a groundwork. So, if you look back on yourself, you can build up more quickly. You have to check. There are also people who demolish all what they did. Others, they they are building sways back and forth. But anyway, all of you can do it. But the important thing is being complacent with fleshly thoughts like, I'm not doing that bad, greatly hinders your change. 
When senior pastor is not here with us, the problem is many of you, uh, people think it wouldn't hurt to live like this. And they seek a comfortable Christian life. It's not based on the standard. It's, it's not according to... But s i n a pastor taught us based on the word of God. Moses also taught the people based on what he heard from God. And the Bible also says, and s i n a pastor also taught us what he was taught by God. But we shouldn't change or alter the words the way we please. We have to set the standard based on the absolute word of God. We have to reflect on our words, thoughts, and faith, and these are these, and quickly achieve a heart of spirit and spiritual faith. After all the tribes were allotted their inheritance, the Levites came before Joshua and received their share. Let's take a look at the map. The 12 tribes were allotted their inheritance. That's how the distribution of the land was done. The Levites were not allotted their inheritance. I mean, even though the Levites uh, did not receive the land as an inheritance, the Levites were different from other tribes. They didn't receive land as inheritance. The Bible says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. As I prepared this message, I was very happy. Basically, I'm also a Levite because I'm a pastor. Father God says, you belong to me. I am your inheritance. Pastors and Levite workers, you have to hold on to this word and pray. You have to say, I belong to God, and God is my inheritance. If you realize this fact, even if you find yourself in a difficult situation, you wouldn't, you belong to God, and Father God is your inheritance. So Father God will take care of your health. According to what you've done and s o n God will give you wisdom and allow you to bear fruit and give you rewards in heaven. and He will also provide you with your necessities and you have such hope. I hope all the Levites will... Instead of giving them land, God had the Levites make a living out of the tithes and offerings the people offer to God. As said in the Bible, they shall teach your ordinances to Jacob and your law to Israel. They shall put incense before you and hold burnt offerings on the altar. God had the Levites offer sacrifices on behalf of the entire Israel and keep His temple. He also assigned them a precious duty of teaching the people the law of God so that the Levites entrusted with this precious duty won't be disturbed by secular business but entirely focused on God's work God Himself offered to become their inheritance. Today, the Levites refer to pastors anointed by God and workers ministering at God's sanctuary. Those who serve as a pastor, that's why, I mean, pastors and Levites workers should remind themselves once again what kind of life they should live. You shouldn't think like, I have... You have to give me a pay raise, but you have to check with yourself whether you really belong to God, whether God can really say towards you, you are mine. That's what is important. You you get paid by the church, and we have become pastors and Levites to work faithfully for God. We have to check whether we are living as the man of truth, whether you are really happy working at a church, whether you keep the same kind of heart you had when you started working at this church. 
And those who serve as a pastor have to entirely dedicate themselves to God. They shouldn't put their mind to secular matters. They shouldn't get another job or run a business out of greed. But regrettably, due to the financial situation or pandemic, um, some pastors are in a sabbatical year. Some of them also have a job under the permission of the church assembly. But it's so regrettable. That's why we have to have a revival so that they can receive a title, a job, so that they can entirely focus on God's work. That's And Levi workers, they should put more, more of their heart and sincerity on God's work. As said in the Bible, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Pastors should dedicate themselves to God's work. And the church, that's why church pays them. But pastors themselves also look at themselves as to whether they really dedicate themselves, whether they try to bring down God's power, whether they are trying to nurture the church members and make them spiritually healthy and bear fruit. But even as a pastor, s should look at themselves and l e v i workers They have to remember why they came, started working in this church, and they know that they can build up rewards in heaven by working for God. So that's why they gave up a higher paycheck out in the world, and they decided to work in the church. But do you still have the same kind of mindset? Do you calculate what you would receive out in the world? You have to compare yourself. What God would say to you? Would He say, you are my Levite? Would He reward you with the rewards in heaven? Pastors and Levite workers should look at themselves in light of this. Pastors should circumcise themselves and pile up numerous hours of prayer so that when they visit and evangelize others, they can have true faith. So that pastors and church workers can dedicate themselves to God's work, the church provides for them. Although the Levites didn't receive land as an inheritance, they were allotted cities to live in and fields to raise their livestock on. God set apart some cities located within other tribes' land and gave them to the Levites. That way, the Levites scattered among all the Israelites. they were separated I mean into other tribes territories they lived with them and carried out their job here we find God's special providence as God had the Levites scattered among the entire Israel each tribe could find them in their own land or nearby This was for the Israelites to readily hear and learn the word of God. Namely, God had all His people stay close to His commands all the time. Today as well, God wants us, His children, to always stay close to Him and be with Him. He wants us to meditate on His word day and night, dwell in it, and gather at the sanctuary to worship prayer, and fellowship. We watched the m a m i magazine and we saw how people diligently attended worship services online. They had cell meetings. They were so happy meeting other fellow cell members, hearing their confessions. I thought, they're truly m a m i members. I also thank all all the church workers involved. As you obey the word, and even though we cannot gather in the sanctuary together, you, we can gather in a different form. That's how we stay close to God. As you stay close to God that way, 
God will also stay close to you, always answering your prayer. The Bible says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands and your sinners and purify your hearts and your double-minded. Another verse says, But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Hopefully, you will always meditate on His word and stay close to Him. Then, He will stay close to you, always answering your prayer. Brothers and sisters, now all the tribes have been allotted their inheritance. Then, what about Joshua's inheritance? The Bible says, when they finished apportioning the land for inheritance by its borders, the sons of Israel gave an inheritance in their midst to Joshua, the son of Nun. In accordance with the command of the Lord, they gave him the city for which he asked. Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, so he built the city and settled in it. Although Joshua was beloved, beloved by God and performed God's power as the leader of the entire Israel, he received an inheritance the latest. What he received as an inheritance was not even a good land. It had been devastated, so he had to build a city there. Here, we can figure out his good heart. Even though he was a strong and bold warrior of faith and was to be served by the people, he served them and yielded to them. Being such a person, he was all the more recognized by God and set up as a leader. Let me conclude the message. The Bible says, You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. What does it mean to fear God? Other verses say, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil and abstain from every form of evil. To abstain from every form of evil means to live by the word of God, become sanctified, and even root out evil from your heart. As you cast off evil like this, fear God and rely on Him. He will help you in every affair and become your shield. God who accompanied Joshua was the God of all the Israelites, and He is also our God. He split the Red Sea, stopped the flow of the Jordan, and stopped the sun and the moon. Even today, If only we believe, He will manifest the same kind of power or even greater power. Therefore, we should completely make faith out of, out of all our experiences here at this church. Even if we face obstacles that seem totally, different from, totally difficult to remove, like the Canaanites with chariots of iron, as believers, I mean, we, we should act boldly, always making confessions of faith. As Joshua proclaimed, For though it is a forest, you shall clear it, and to its farthest borders it shall be yours. We should be more than able to take all the blessings. As you do so, I pray in our Lord's name that God will be moved by your bold faith, quickly lead you to the blessed land, and allow you to enjoy to your heart's content the good fruits of Canaan that He promised. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and the internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. 
burned all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria, be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases, such as colds and fever, go away from them, protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers, like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bonds of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.